Let us pray. Father, we gather here in your presence, and as we do so, Lord, we open your holy word. Speak to us, Father, from uh, the pages of your sacred word. Touch our hearts and move our lives into a closer relationship with you, we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. I love this time of year. How about you? 104 and 105 degree weather gives way to 75 and 80 at night. You can sleep with your windows open. Kids are back in school, back in church. You're back from fishing and whatever else you did this summer. It's good to worship the Lord together. A bit of trivia, just as we start, which will actually set a framework, uh, an illustration to introduce our subject today. It indeed is to be celebrated by some as a 96th anniversary. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? No, I didn't think too many of the ladies would get, catch this one. September 26, 96th anniversary of the first game featuring an APF team was played at Rock Island's Douglas Park. You don't even know what that is. It's the precursor to the NFL. So gentlemen, I thought you would at least remember that anniversary. Remembering your wife's anniversary probably is far more important. Now, if that's not enough, Thursday indeed is the first anniversary, <laughs> first anniversary, first game of the NFL season. Now I have a special attachment to it because the Broncos are playing. My right arm is a Vikings fan and my left arm is a Broncos fan. So the 26th is the first game of this season. So why do I share that with you? It's a bit of trivia and I know some of you are into trivia. So the last trivia uh, question would be, what was one of the most unusual plays in NFL history that the person probably wish he had never made and is well remembered despite all of the plays uh, in, F in NFL history? The first clue is the individual's name was Jim Marshall. Yes, that's right. NFL Films made the gaffe by Minnesota Vikings defenseman Jim Marshall Famous, a prominent player on the Vikings Purple People Eaters, as they are known in the land of 10,000 lakes, played 20 seasons and was regarded as one of the finer defense linemen of his era. So what is, he, what is he well remembered for after 20 seasons of play and being one of the finer players? It was an infinite play from a game against San Francisco on October 25, 1964, that brought him argu arguably into his biggest fame. He eagerly and alertly snagged a loose ball that was fumbled by San Francisco uh, defense, uh, San Francisco offense, Billy Kelmer. Marshall, in the days and excitement, scooped the ball up, unencumbered, ran into the end zone. Unfortunately, he had become disoriented and ran, ran to the wrong end zone. So rather than scoring six points for the Vikings, he scored a safety for the 49ers. That indeed, for those who are not football fans, means the other, other team got two points. My first inkling was that something was wrong, he said, was when a 49er player came up to me and gave me a hug in the end zone. Then I thought something was wrong. Hmm. running excitedly 
in the wrong direction. Running unencumbered, thinking you're going the right way, only to find out you're going the wrong way. Has it ever happened to you? I pulled out of an alley one day in a strange city and I turned what I thought was the right way and all the cars were driving towards me. It's only happened once. I gingerly moved as far right and crept along at two miles an hour until I could get turned around. It's important to know which way to be heading, isn't it? Hmm. So do we ever, as Christians, think we're heading the right way when in fact we may be going in the opposite way of what God wants for us? Let me suggest to you today, as we examine Saul's life, that he was the most reluctant, he was the most unlikely disciple to ever be called of God. He was the terrorist of Christians during his day. He was not the poster child for Christ in the beginning. The most unlikely person to be called, he was heading the wrong way, thinking it was the right way. I'd invite you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. You've heard the anchor texts in Acts, and we will come to them in just a minute. But let's not assume that we have a full understanding, but let's read his own description of his life. In Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, there's three parts to his life. There's the part that uh, he describes in Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. Before he met Jesus, in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, he says, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversion in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Wow! What an introduction. You're asked to speak in a church next week. And your introduction goes something like this. You may have heard about me. I was the one who was persecuting you just a little while ago until Jesus came into my life. It's a bone-chilling introduction, isn't it? Until we realize it's, a, it's an introduction filled with the goodness and graciousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if by way of comparison and contrast we look at Saul, he calls himself the chief of all sinners. Somewhere in there we can find in the shadows descriptions of our own life. While, well, while we have not been responsible perhaps for the death of others, we certainly would call ourselves sinners at times if we're honest in heart. And if Christ can save him, perhaps God's goodness and grace can extend to us. Underline that little word in verse 12, but by the revelation of Jesus, Christ came to me. For you've heard of my conversion or transformation that's happened to me. And profited the Jews' religion above, uh, above many, my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when, 
But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, called me by His grace, that little word but, I was being held captive by the traditions, by men's idea of how God should send His Son and how He should come. But when it pleased God, He called me out of those traditions by His marvelous grace that I might live for Him. I love that little word, but. But when God calls, nothing else matters. Have you ever found yourself at some point in your life going the wrong way from God's calling? Ever wandered down those paths? Sometimes we do it intentionally. Sometimes we do it accidentally. Sometimes we're there not because of our choosing, but because of instances and things and events that come into our lives that just cause us to be disoriented. And we say, God, where are you? Have you been there, friends, at times? Maybe you have. Maybe you are. But I love that little word, but. But God is here with you now. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? amen? If you don't realize it now, maybe it will come to you Tuesday of next week or Thursday or Friday when you find yourself wondering, which way am I heading in my life? He called me by His grace, verse 16, to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the heathen. Immediately I confer not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. After his conversion, he started to tell people about the goodness of grace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles I saw none, save James, the Lord's brother. In verse 23, it says, As he preached, they had only heard that which persecuted us in times past, now preached the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. What an amazing story! Do you like that story? I love that story. But it doesn't belong in the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts is about Acts of the Apostles. We often think about it that way, don't we? The Acts of the Apostles. But in reality, the book of Acts is the book of God's Acts working through the Apostles. Now, if we've got, a, we've got the introduction in Saul's own words describing his life, it's not a stretch to say that he is not a likely candidate to be a disciple of Christ, is it? Hmm. But we have to also quickly say, how likely is it that any one of us would be a disciple of Christ? save for His goodness and grace. Have you ever been there on the wrong road, going full speed? You got your GPS on, you pull into traffic, and it's beeping. Turn right 200 feet, turn left 200 feet, only to find the road close sign in front of you because the GPS isn't working properly. Heading full speed into life of your own design and your own choosing, your own career path. You've got everything figured out. A nice house, a nice car, a good relationship with your wife, kids in tow, you go to church one week to the other. And sometimes you feel close to the Lord and sometimes you wonder where He is. And everything's going along just as you have planned. Anything wrong with that life? But, that little word, but, we've got it all planned. But what is 
God's plan. Saul, Acts chapter 9, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly there shined around him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, or the sharp goading point that they would drive animals with. And he trembled, and he was astonished, and the Lord said, What have I to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told what they must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no man. And he arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. For he was blind how many days? Three days in darkness. Three days in darkness. Have you ever been just in the land of wandering in darkness and days? Where is this going to end in my life? Where is this time of loneliness? Where is this time of spiritual desperation? How am I going to get this figured out? Now the man who had it all put together thought he had all the light he needed. He had it figured out. He was moving. It wasn't as if he was inactive. This was the man who held the garments at the stoning of who? Stoning of Stephen. Just last week, we looked at Stephen's commitment and Stephen's courage. And off in the shadows was Saul, the most unlikely one that would ever become a disciple of Christ. How can it be? How can it be? But God takes care of us in His goodness and grace. The voice of God cuts through the darkness penetrates the darkness, but in order to get his attention, he blinds the eyes of Saul, that he can't see anything. Have you ever felt that way? You know there's something out there that God wants you to do. You just can't see it. And in the quietness and the darkness, God's voice is heard, the voice of his Holy Spirit. Move forward, move forward, move forward. And in the case of Saul, and in the case I would like to suggest to you today, he tells Saul to move forward and seek out fellow believers in Christ. That he might be embraced. Now, as we look, He's trembling as he enters the city. And the men with, that journeyed with him in verse 7 stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and he was blind for three days, and he did not eat. And as he came to Damascus, uh, excuse me, verse 10 says, As they came to Damascus, a man named Ananias came to him and said, The Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here. He said, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays. And he saw in the vision a man named Ananias coming in. And he put his hand on him that he might receive sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard of this man, how much evil he's done in the street, uh, to the saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority of the chief priest to bind all that call upon his name. But the Lord said, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings and the children of Israel. And verse 17 says, Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, has appeared to me unto thee in the way that thou comest and has sent me, that thou mightest receive sight and be filled with what? The Holy Ghost. I love the story. I love the story, don't you? Here he is, 
a zealot for the Jews walking away from Christ. God says, wait a minute, I'm going to give his attention. I'm going to get his attention. He's going to have three days of darkness. I'm going to tell him by, the, by speaking to him through the Holy Spirit that he needs to find the followers of Christ who he once one day persecuted and killed. Now, when he comes into the congregation, everybody in the congregation knew who he was. You want to have him over to your house today, friends, for fellowship lunch? The one who just took the life of another believer in Christ just a short time before? It's an amazing story of comparison and contrast, of darkness and light, of walking in the right path and walking in the wrong path. And the amazing thing about it is, God doesn't leave us alone, even in our darkness, when we think we're doing right, when we're actually on the wrong path. He sends His Holy Spirit into our lives, through circumstances, through people, through darkness, through discouragement. And He sends His Holy Spirit at the same time to gently whisper in our ear, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I designed you for something better than the drugs you're doing, than the selfish way that you're living, and in the pride that you have in your accomplishment. I designed you to be my disciple. I designed you to carry the message of grace and goodness and transformation and conversion into a world of darkness. For you see, in all of that, all of that experience, Saul caught it. He caught the gospel in one word, as being conversion or transformation. It's the only hope that we have. It's the only hope that he has. And immediately his eyes were opened, and it has been as if scales had fallen off. He stayed there, uh, verse 19 says, certain days with the disciples, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. And Saul, verse 22 says, increased more in strength and confounded the Jews with, uh, which dwelt in Damascus, to such a degree that they lowered him by a basket, over the wall so that he could escape with safety. How is it, friends, in your life? Do you find yourself having a close relationship with Christ? We find that Saul, as he was transformed and converted and became Paul, enjoyed having a grace-filled experience experience with Christ, one that brought deliverance where there was adjunct, adjunct slavery to sin and wrong ways of living, one that brought life, one that brought hope, one that brought power, one that brought forgiveness, one that brought acceptance. And that same grace that same grace is extended to us. For you see, the book of Acts wasn't just a book for Jesus' day. We today may be traveling on the right pathway with Christ. We may be on the wrong pathway with Christ. And He will, by His Spirit, by His power, allow us to be transformed, to be converted, to turn to walk with him. Ephesians said, Saul, Paul, became one of the greatest theologians of the New Testament, that the transformation must take place first in the mind. He says, be renewed, Ephesians 4.23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, be renewed in the spirit of your thoughts, be renewed in the spirit of your actions, so that for me to live 
I must, 1 Corinthians 15, 31 says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily, that I might live daily for Christ. So how is it, friends? We gather here to worship. It's an interesting thing. We gather here to worship. And the house today is filled with sinners. I being chief of all of them. In our house today, we have those who have turned their backs to God many years ago. We have those who have stolen. We have those who have lied. Those who have cheated. Those who have done crimes against one another, crimes against the state, small things, large things, but sin nonetheless. We all come unworthy of God's forgiveness, God's presence, and God's grace. We all come from a background like Paul, a long ways away from where God wants us to be, at least at, what, at one time. But we only come because of the goodness and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that one word, but the Lord Jesus Christ calls us, calls us to be transformed and converted after his likeness and walk in his way that today you might determine doesn't matter where I've been I'm not sure what the road in front of me holds but I know I'm going to look to Jesus I know that I'm going to seek him I know whatever door he opens I'm going to go through because I know that's where he wants me to be. How is it in your heart, friend? Do you want to declare that to the Lord Jesus today? That in the books of heaven, that I might say, on this Sabbath day, I made my decision. There is no looking back, only looking forward. I put behind me all those things and I eagerly, eagerly embrace the Spirit of God to live for Him. Let us pray together. Father, on the cross of Christ, He bore all of our sins. Father, we see by example the way You have worked in Saul's life, the transformation of his life, the conversion, the good news, Father, that that conversion is possible through your goodness and grace. And in the shadow of that story, Father, we find our own life story. From moment to moment, being close to you, and from moment by moment, turning away from you, but by your goodness and grace, Father, you come calling, you come seeking, you come begging us to come back to walk with you. Father, we just yield ourselves to you. Keep us, Father, in the pathway that leads to your kingdom. By your Spirit, guide us. By your Spirit, empower us. By your Spirit, protect us against all, all of the powers of evil that will come calling this week. Father, may we walk. May we walk with you. We too are some of the most unlikely disciples. But we are yours because of what Jesus has done. And through his goodness and through his grace, we claim that promise of acceptance. We ask for an infilling of your spirit.
through Christ's precious name. Amen.